it's one bird It's the morning star rising from the sunset Bring it back home like a conquest In a great shout, hallelujah, like a gun clap One crown, one throne, one chair I'm the corner, who wanna In an antenna, the puna, puna In an alatinena, yes, puna, puna Was the youth again, the champ is here And I to defend his title To put an end to your defeat, like cool To humble the exalted and to exalt the humble The weakness of every challenge is pride If you see a high horse, don't take a ride He who wants to battle, let him strangle himself Put a mic cord, your arms to shot to box with God Keep entangled in the struggle Welcome to the end of your hustle Tonight, we're rolling with the king of the castle Good evening everybody, good afternoon Good morning, wherever <coughs> you are in, in, in your time zone. Uh, welcome to a very interesting discussion um, between uh, myself and uh, Mr. Nobody here. I don't know if he wants to be called by a different name. So no, call me Nobody, it's perfect. Nobody is one. <laughs> all right okay all right no problem so we are live the the show is being recorded so the discussion today is did africans surrender or sell out to invaders and uh, uh mr nobody didn't like the the title either so i think he can uh, perhaps <laughs> Perhaps let us know <clears throat> what he prefers, how he would have uh, preferred that I phrase the, the, the topic of discussion this evening uh, from my time zone. So, yeah, so that's going to be the discussion. So what we're going to do is uh, we'll, uh, we'll start with our conclusions as opening, uh, opening statements, and then we'll... We'll run through, uh, you know, he will have a chance to basically break down and justify his stance on the, on the subject. And I will do, uh, do so also. And then <clears throat> when we have exhausted our, uh, our, uh, our, basically our, 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 our discussion, then we'll open the floor for questions, comments, and etc. So I'll let him, uh, let me let Mr. Nobody, uh, I don't like the, but anyway, let me not, let me not. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Like name my name, nobody. It's no, don't fine. worry. Don't worry. Okay, it's cool. All right, so I will, I will let you have the first go. And you can start with your conclusion as a as an opening statement, and then I will take it from there. That sounds great. I mean, the the first thing, the issue with the question, I feel like, is that when we talk about Africans, it's easy for us to consider Africa as like one place and forget that there's several different places within Africa. And so, it would be true to say that Africans did surrender. And it would also be true to say Africa, some Africans sold out or, my, in my opinion, made compromises with invaders to preserve their culture, to preserve their secrets, to preserve their people, and also to deal with um, even infighting within, within their cultures. Even go as far as to say that the... I would also go as far as to say that the size of Africa makes it very difficult for them to, to outright if they were connected, or if all African countries were connected, it would be very difficult for them to defend all, all sides of the continent because of its size. And so certain cultures, and the ones that exist, I believe, um, they just realize that it's easier for us to make compromises versus trying to defend against every single invader. And I believe the current version of... African leaders, that's what they've decided to do for partly for selfish reasons, obviously. Greed has always existed in Africa and all around the world, 
but also because it's just a smart it's a smart decision for many of the countries to make certain types of compromises so that they don't have to spend the the resources to create <coughs> sizable armies to defend the way the West does. It's, uh, that's that's my last that's oh. my opening. So All right. there we go. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, from my side, my take is is pretty much the opposite. So my take is um, we Africans have never had to surrender to um, <clears throat> to Europeans or Arabs, but historically, what we see is that um, as long as Africans whatever portion of Africa, uh, as long as they had everything together as they supposed to, in, <clears throat> in the definition of what you call Ubuntu, as long as they upheld that principle that which they were given to, to us by the ancestors, they were never defeated. It's only, we only see them actually surrendering, not even surrendering, but my take is more like they handed over in exchange for uh, cheap gifts at the end of the day. So that's going to be the foundation of basically the debate. And uh, <clears throat> in terms of the, the, the way we're going to do it, uh, you present your case, and then you present um, historical uh, references to whatever you are putting on the table. So I will start by basically addressing some of the things you mentioned. And the first one I'd like to address is, is uh, the part where you actually said that <coughs> Africa is a big place, uh, we we shouldn't speak of Africa as if it's uh, it's like a monolith. How people always always put it, they say Africa has different cultures and they should not be boxed in uh, boxed together and all that. So I I I actually have a very opposing view towards that um, that standpoint because. When you uh, when you start speaking of uh, issues of a group of people, if you talk about, for example, you, when everybody talks about uh, Europe and whatever, nobody says, ah, but Europe is different. They come from the, the the British and the French, but usually when we talk about uh, colonialism and 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 the doctrine of white supremacy, quote unquote, we speak of we we put them in one box because it's relevant within what we are talking about. We can always human beings will always be uh, be boxed together depending on what you are talking about. You know, if you talk about <clears throat> if you talk about the stages of of human growth and development. That's just going to apply to all human beings, regardless of race, ethnicity, and etc. So, within the discussion of Africa, African culture, African history, African heritage, there is no difference. From Cape to Cairo, it's all the same thing. It's not a monolith. It's the same thing, different variations. So from my side, I am going to even show uh, historical patterns of how Africa was handed over, was sold to the highest bidder from day one. And we were not defeated on the battlefield. So that is going to be my take. So I don't know if you would like to respond to that. Mr. Nobody? Uh, when you say not defended, what are you, or not defeated ever, 
Um, what time period are we talking about? I'm talking ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then I'm gonna call. I'm gonna call you on that. <laughs> okay, no problem. Because remember, I'm gonna call you on okay, because remember, um, when we speak of defeat of Africa, we're talking about when Africa was taken. You know, put in quote unquote taken. By the Arabs you, and the if Europeans, you, yeah. If you say all of, in a way, if you say all of our Africa, then you're you're one hundred percent correct. It has never been never been completely taken. It's not never going. It would not happen. But if you say parts of Africa, um, then I would then that would be a different conversation. All right. Okay. So we shall find out. So my question, my first question to you then would then be. <coughs> uh, then if you can take us through the different regions of Africa, how they were uh, invaded and they lost the battles, name the battles that they lost, and etc. And I'll give my own uh, historical accounts to show that. You, okay, so you, so you will, I, I won't be able to do every single battle, but I will be able to say, uh, based on specifically uh, black civilization, the, um, the book that I posted earlier, that there was a situation where Arabs did take over at least parts of Egypt and other parts of Africa. That is, that is known. Um, and has had created different cultural problems in those particular regions, specifically Egypt. Um, but, what's, but what's interesting is that the Europeans uh, took over or checked, the, as a, if I want to quote uh, Destruction of Occupation, checked... Uh, the Arab imperialism, um, and that's kind of what we have today, where the Europeans have still exist in, in different ways uh, and certain types of control of Africa. Um, if that's what you're referring to, yes. If you if you want to come um, argue that didn't happen or it happened in a different way, that's fine, <coughs> and then I can I can give you a counterpoint. All right. Okay. So you. No, we're not going to, obviously, we're not going to give every single battle African. No, no African, way, I can't. <laughs> I'm African, not able to. <laughs> African, African history is, has been in existence for, I mean, African history goes over 5,000 years, so that, that, that's not that. But obviously, yeah, it's definitely further. I mean, South Africa alone take, gives you 160,000 or 75,000, depending on, uh, whose data you actually believe, but yeah. So, but obviously the idea here is to give us samples, you know, and give us different battles. You mentioned Egypt. That's an interesting one. Why? Because yeah. the question is, was Egypt taken from the indigenous people or did the Arabs find Egypt already taken? Because remember, when we speak of defeat, we are talking about taken from the indigenous people. If somebody takes my house and then you come and you take the house, uh, you need to start with the person that actually evicted me from my house and took my house. That's the, that's the actual defeat because it's against the indigenous people. So in terms of Egypt, when was Egypt? When was Egypt taken from the indigenous people, and who took it, and how? Interesting, interesting way of phrasing, because you could say that you could make an argument that it was never really taken from the indigenous people. It's just that the Arabs assumed power, and then what they did is they created um, through their power they created cultural differences that forced uh, indigenous people to assimilate. And stay in that region, and then those people that left the region um, obviously they didn't want to simulate, so you know they were no longer in Egypt again. So I mean, you could make the you could easily make the argument that it was never really taken, but people assumed leadership after you know whatever for whatever reasons. You could even make an argument that they sold it to the highest bidder, like you said. Um, you know that's it's a decent it's an argument that you could have, you could make easily. All right. Okay. Actually, uh, I'm going to answer the question for you in terms of Egypt, because I, I, okay. I, I study that 
I've studied that part, that history as well quite intensively. Egypt was taken when we talk uh, when we speak of the last the last con I mean Egypt has had uh, invaders who were evicted and the, and then indigenous people come back and retake it. But when we speak of the actual the final uh, uh, the final defeat of Egypt, where Egypt was actually taken from the last indigenous people, and the indigenous people never rose up to be able to take it back, it was the time of the Greeks. And this will be very interesting. Why? How did the Greeks take Egypt? Did the Greeks march all the way from Athens and say, we are going to take the mighty Kemet and conquer it? As uh, usually when people speak of their history, they say that the Greeks invaded Egypt. The Greeks never invaded Egypt. And that is the actual truth. When we, uh, what actually happened, when you look at, uh, whenever, if you look at the pattern of Egypt being invaded and conquered and then retaken. We find a pattern where when Egypt gets taken, the, the indigenous people uh, go and seek uh, for, for assistance from, the, from their brothers in the south, in, in the Sudan. The so-called Nubians, um, obviously the term has been generalized quite a lot. Uh, there's different groups of people within the, 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 the term called Nubia. So they would go to the south and they would get assistance and the, the Nubians would march up and they would uh, drive out the invaders and they would come and restore the culture. The last event of that kind was the most glorious one. It's called the 25th Dynasty. During the 25th dynasty, Egypt was also taken in the sense that uh, it was divided. There was no longer a, a Sematawi, what they call the, 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 the ruler of the two lands. So what had happened is when, the, when uh, Pai, uh, Pianka and, and the gang from the south, they went up into Egypt, they found that it was in disarray. Some of the chiefs, especially in the northern part, had uh, had made a pact with invaders and, and, and stuff like that. So when they came in and they restored it, they, did, they, they, they with the holy war that actually happened. And on top of that, they restored the monuments. To a point, today we know about the Memphite theology, all because of the 25th dynasty, because it is a theology that had sort of been lost. It, you, we, we don't find it in, in, the, in the dynasties before in terms of the actual inscriptions on the, on, the, on the monuments. So then when the local uh, tribalists <laughs> uh, kicked out the 25th dynasty, of uh, the, the, the local indigenous uh, people of Kemet or ancient Egypt, they when they drove out, they eventually drove out the 25th dynasty. And then, um, at the time when I think it was the the Persians were had had taken over uh, Kemet, then the ruler at the time forsook the ways of his ancestors. Instead of going to the south, he thought, ah, you know this whole tribalism thing? Instead, this is what he did. He did something that was never ever done in the whole history of Kemet 4,000 years. He did something for the first time. He went to the Greeks. Instead of his neighbors close by, he ran all the way to the Greeks Alexandra, the so-called great, did not had no ambition. I mean, that guy was a conqueror among Europeans, 
but he never dreamt of ever trying to attempt Kemet because the Greeks had high regard for Kemet and they understood they had lived, many of them had lived there for centuries. So they had understood that they, they're not a force to be messed with and also they desired more of the knowledge rather than, you know, taking over. So the, the ruler at the time, Alexander was then became a mercenary, you know, he became a mercenary in the war. They used the Greeks as mercenaries and the, to get rid of the Persians. And then when Alexander defeated the Persians, he's like, wait a minute. The Persians are out because of me. You guys got to crown me as Pharaoh. We the now head dudes in charge here. Um, you better act like you know. And then that's when the Greeks took over. The Greeks never even had a, in their wildest dreams, ever thought of invading Kemet. And so, when the Greeks uh, took over, because of invitation, this, you see this example I'm giving you now, you will see it all as a pattern, all throughout. And so, the Greeks took over, and they ran the whole empire down to the ground. And then the Romans came and the indigenous people never recovered. They never took Kim back uh, from the invaders. So there's never been a restoration ever since then. That's when, so the Arabs, when they came, they, <laughs> they didn't conquer the indigenous people. They found the place already in disarray. It was already plundered and taken over. There was no indigenous people to conquer. They basically took over the current invader at the time. So, to make it really a, a more valid point, we would need to have examples of Arabs coming and facing the indigenous people toe-to-toe -to -toe in a battlefield. And you'd have to actually give us examples of battles. And I am, that's exactly what I am going to do. I am going to give uh, examples of battles to show that Africans were actually not a force to be messed with. They were a force to be reckoned with when it comes to battle. And even speaking of the Arabs, uh, in the Umayyad, when the, when, the, when the Umayyad into Spain in the year 711, it was not the Arabs that actually conquered Europe. It was an African army. And we know this even from the writings of King Alfonso who actually describes the army and says uh, the, 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 the Moors had, had pitch uh, black faces like coal and they were the handsome, he actually said something about the, the handsomest among them was as, as black as coal. Uh, not that the Arabs were not there, but the force that actually took Europe was actually there. And even when the Arabs came into Africa, they, they, at, at the time, they had already had been using Africans as... Um, African so-called slaves, you know, prisoners of war, like the, the term slave. They were using Africans. For example, we have um, a, 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 a historical figure called Antara. His mother is Ethiopian who was captured and she became a concubine. And the Arab uh, raped her. She had a child who became a bastard. He became, amongst the Arab world, this man was a, until today, is a symbol of of courage and, and warfare because nobody could face him on the battlefield and he was a, a great poet as well. So uh, so from my side what I would say is if you can give us basically examples or historical accounts where Africans face Arabs or Europeans and actually lost the battle and then figured hey because we can't really defeat these guys because they have guns and we don't. Uh, so let's surrender. So as many as you can, at least five or three 
at least three, <laughs> at least three battles. That 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 at least. I mean, we're talking about five thousand years of history. I wasn't even talking about the guns. The gun part was well. The guns have happened afterwards because the idea is that the Moors gave the guns to the Europeans in the first place. But that uh, was just a referring to. I was my point is not referring to it in terms of like the inability. It's just a matter of cost, right? It's less costly for me to make a compromise than it is for me to to create defense for every single country within Africa. It's just it's it's just and it's smarter to compromise in general. So that's why when you ask your question, Africans surrender or sell to invaders. It's a bit of both. But you want. But you, your question is that you need five battles. I mean, you have more history, historical knowledge than me, and I guess you're really saying that there aren't five battles where Africans lost to Europeans summarily um, at all. Uh, okay, or, okay. Or, you don't need five. Only, okay, or, two at least. Two. Or, 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 Give us two. Or they only. They, oh, excuse me. Or they only conquered. They only conquered places that where indigenous people didn't exist. Um, I think that's, I think that's your point, right? Okay. Um, okay. Yes. 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 Basically, what I'm saying, because the, the debate is, did we sur- did we surrender? Because surrender means you you counter the cost of war. You see, what you are saying is true in general. But what we are testing here is, is it true specifically for Africa? So, so basically what I'm saying is, if, if you look at South Africa, for example, or Africa today, it was, it's already sold to the Europeans, right? So the Chinese can come in and buy their portion. So it does not mean that the Chinese defeated us because the Chinese came and bought their portion. Just Southern Africa or Africa as a whole. And I actually see this quite a lot in, in areas like Mozambique and and uh, Namibia uh, more than I see it uh, in, in South Africa. So it does not mean that um, we surrendered to the Chinese. It's just that we had already we were already on the ground in chains. So you can always come and take from someone that's already in chains, but what we are trying to 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 find a point a point of defeat would be before anybody come, comes and takes you over. That's the point of defeat, or the point of surrender. So you don't have to give five; you can give two or three. You know, battles and show at least a pattern over the past 2,000 years where Africans had an actual battle toe-to-toe with Arabs or Europeans where they actually come, to, they figured, oh, we are outnumbered or outgunned or, or anything like that. And they're like, okay, you know what? We're not going to fight this one. We're just going to negotiate. And... That's basically uh, all I'm asking from you. And, you know, just to encourage you, I'll, I'll give my second example. <laughs> all right. So, after Egypt was taken, uh, the Romans came and formed the greatest empire ever created in Europe. The longest ruling empire. It became a, quite an empire. It became an empire, the first empire empire in that sense it was much bigger than greece because they, they took over quite a large number of the known world at the time so when the romans the romans didn't defeat egypt you didn't surrender to the romans <laughs> it was already taken you know already sold to the to the greeks centuries before that so when the romans found that, okay, we didn't really do much about Egypt. It was an inheritance. (laughs) So they had ambitions to then go into the Sudan and take over the next most powerful nation. Now, Sudan had never been taken by 
or, or, or conquered by any force from outside of Africa at that time. So the Romans figured, hey, since we are the mighty Roman Empire, we've conquered North Africa, we, these are all our provinces, you know, um, we will go into the Sudan. And so they started making demands upon Sudan and then making threats. And at, during the time, there was a, 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 a queen that was in charge, you know, a Mama Amenaritas. I think I'm, I'm probably saying her name uh, incorrectly. But she, she's like, oh, okay. So these guys think they, they can come mess with me. I'm not going to wait for them to come here. She instead marched in, she marched to Egypt. She said, okay, you guys, I'll save you a trip. <laughs> I'll bring the battle to you. She went, marched into, into, into Kemet and fought the Romans and defeated them, the mighty Roman Empire. She defeated Caesar. And as a, as a token of victory, she took one of Caesar's uh, statues, the head. I don't know if she cut it off herself or whatever, but she took the head and went back to uh, to the Sudan or Nubia or whatever you want to call it, Kush. She went back to Kush. And she buried it in one of the monuments, I think, by the staircases where she actually would walk as a symbol of... Uh, of trampling upon the head of C of um, of Caesar. Then the Romans backed off. The Romans uh, decided, okay, let's negotiate. <laughs> we don't want no smoke. That is the history. So uh, that is another account we see there that um, the the Romans who at that time where one uh, after alexander as a personality there has not been any army out of europe that has dared to be that mighty and take over uh, a large part of the world and they 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 that they, they became humbled and they got to the sudan so that would be my second example they could not defeat her they could not defeat her, you know. So, yeah, I will then give you a chance, you know, to do likewise, to be only fair. Well, I mean, so the um, so you don't count um, destructions of cities as examples of where Africans may have decided to make um, uh, compromises with their invaders at that time. Like, uh, uh, in, for example, in Banza, Congo, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, uh -huh. um, and Carthage. Okay. All right. So, you speak of um, Banza, Congo. Uh, everything, like, if when you speak of, of the, the destruction of cities, before you can destroy someone's city, you'd actually have to defeat them, you know. You actually have to conquer them. And now, going back to Carthage, very interesting. The Romans, uh, there was a man, an African, called... Uh, uh, why, why is his name running away from me? Everybody knows him. In the greatest general who ever lived coming, coming out of Carthage. Um, come on, help me out, somebody. <laughs> let me, let me, let me. I don't know. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Right, um, okay, uh, I will. I'm gonna. Aurelius? Nah, 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 nah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you the name now. Uh, greatest Army General Carthage. I mean, it's gonna be an easy search. I don't know why his name is like just running away from Hannibal. Damn. Yeah. 
That's the name. Hannibal. Look, Hannibal. That's Hannibal. Course, How can I forget no, 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 Hannibal. Hannibal? Yeah, Hannibal. General Hannibal. Let's put respect to his name. General Hannibal went into Rome. Or he marched with his elephant. And he and he he whipped their butts to the ground. Now you spoke of the destruction of the, of of Carthage. Okay, cool. But did and you Congo, know? Congo. Yeah. But did you know that the Romans could not defeat Hannibal? They were actually held by a group of Africans. It was Africans. Yeah. Well, that isn't that kind of your isn't that part of your point though? Whereas like there was more internal struggle within Africans that caused these types of situations versus people actually or outsiders conquering African uh, civilizations. Okay. So basically so basically what I'm saying is if you and I have a first fight, right, and you fail to defeat me, right, and then your wife comes in and bangs me on the head with a pot and I fall again. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't count as a victory. You get what I'm saying? Well, it was not but it why not? Well, I mean, in the, in the theater of war, war, that is a victory. Uh, no, it's not. It's a, I'm, talk, I'm talking about... Okay, let me actually terrify what I mean. Yes, okay. the, you do get the credit for, for playing fly. I mean, I mean when, you, when, when you look at uh, the art of war or fighting, so you've got trained fighters, for example, so a, a trained fighter can lose a fight in a street fight for a very specific reason. Because a trained fighter fights with honor. A trained fighter will not uh, continue beating you up while you're on the ground. A trained fighter will not grab a man's testicles in a fight. You get what I'm saying? But yeah, anyway. So, uh, when, when we speak, when I'm saying, yeah, well, you will get the credit of winning because you strategize and whatever, but it will not be in the history of generals. Do you know why they call Hannibal the greatest general, even though he lost to the Romans? Because they saying in terms of his military might and genius, he was not matched by anyone at that time, yes, he lost because his brothers turned on him. You know what I'm saying? So, oh no, totally. Yeah. So, so that is basically my argument: is that we, we, our ancestors have never been a match to anyone historically. Ever, there's never been an army mighty enough to make us think, oh gosh, we better uh, have a, a peace treaty, we better talk. It's never been there. That is basically my argument. Yes, you can, you can win by applying uh, different methods, uh, cheating, whatever you want to do, you know. So that's basically what I'm trying to say. So before the Romans could burn down Carthage, they had to get help from Africans to take down who? Hannibal. And those Africans were losers because what did the Romans do? Did they say, okay, you guys now cool, we're gonna reward you? No. They used them. So that is the, essentially what I am saying. Because the thing is why this is important to understand. In, in, in our imaginations, when we look at how recent history has been, uh, or when we look around basically reality, we see ourselves under European domination. We see uh, black people being shot down in the United States. We see, uh, you know, all these things. And we're like, oh, I guess... I guess they, they, they're holding us down with guns. I guess they must have first defeated us with those guns, but that is not the case. 
that is basically what I'm saying. I don't know if you want to yeah. say something to that. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I'm not really, I, I can't, I don't think that's an arguable point as far as, like, I want to argue against it. I think that, like, if you look at, if I only focus on Egypt history, which you said that you spent a lot of time with, that's the same thing that happened in Egypt where people who, made, who took over power, um, they were able to convince uh, black people that they were not, um, they were not who they were. And even to the point of destroying uh, some of the some of the elements of black superiority or examples of black superiority uh, in that particular area. And I think that the, in general, the people that were successful in taking over anything in Africa, they never did it um, in a military fashion, just as you're saying. They always did it in conjunction with some type of psychological attack or um, some type of religious attack or some type of... Um, some type of subversive action that forced uh, black people to somewhat turn on themselves or or um, be weaker for opposition. And so I wouldn't. I, I don't see a per. I don't see how I would argue against um, the military thing. Although I do know of situations where um, there was trade. Um, I, I don't remember the. I don't remember the. I, I don't. What was it? Was it with Portugal? That would be a question. Was it with Portugal where? Uh, I don't remember the exact, the exact group. I can look it up, but where they Portugal was stealing African slaves, and so what the what the people did is that they decided to um, to make a pact with Portugal as far as like what they were going to trade. That's the only time that I could, but it wasn't a military thing. They just, they just didn't want them to steal. Um, they wanted to give only the ones that they wanted. Um, I think that happened a couple of times, though. But I, it wouldn't fall under the idea that um, Europeans were conquering or something of that nature. All right. Okay. Do you know what I'm referring to? Do you know the group I, I'm referring to? Um, I, I'm I not. Can look it up. I just yeah. I don't have it on top of my head. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I'll speak about the Portuguese and perhaps you, it might link up to what you are talking about. Okay. Uh, the Portuguese, for me, the Portuguese story is my favorite to tell. It's the untold story of, of the Portuguese in Africa. The Portuguese in Africa have really suffered. Uh, in terms of ambition and work and groundwork, the Portuguese were supposed to even have Southern Africa. They were supposed to have the Congo. Uh, they were supposed to have Zimbabwe. Uh, you could even say argue South Africa, but yeah. They were supposed to have quite a large place because the Portuguese really put in the work. When you speak of the Congo, the Portuguese the Congo Empire was quite large. It included what you call Angola today and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. So when the Portuguese had come, they, this has been basically the pattern when you uh, refer to the, the book you are talking about, the destruction of black civilization by the Grand Master Chancellor Williams. I respect that man. He took 16 years to do the groundwork, field study, in Africa to actually get the full picture of what really, really happened. Because, I mean, uh, prior to me coming into the field of studying African history, I was obviously of the view that, oh, we had spears, they had guns, and so, hey, we lost. And, which is pretty much the majority view in the African world globally. So the when the Portuguese came, missionaries were very key. Missionaries were very, very key to the conquering of the Congo, or basically Africa in general. So when they came in, they, they brought um, gifts and the chiefs, or the leader or the kings, the kings and chiefs. So the kings and chiefs that, that 
uh, were enticed by the gifts and what they could get from the relationship with the the, the Portuguese, um, they ended up being baptized because there was an incentive from the Portuguese to be baptized. Because if you were baptized, because it was very important the Portuguese remember prior to that were ruled by Africans come from that part of Europe so they under I don't know if it's something they understood or it uh, it was just a fluke because a king sat in a position that also made him a priest to the people which means as a priest remember a priest is someone that represents the people to God and he 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 was the person that um, would would come and say he is the son of God, the chosen one of God to be the ruler of the people. So that has been the norm. So as soon as he converted to or was baptized into then Christianity, that means he's uh, he he is now he no longer. He's no longer the next, uh, the highest power just under God. He now reports to the king in Portugal. So therefore he's below him because he's now baptized under them, in under Catholicism. So what had actually happened during then is that because the, the Congo Empire was so vast, there were many, it was a unified kingdom. You know, the, the concept of unified kingdoms has been in Africa for, for many years where different clans came under one banner as a kingdom. So the different chiefs, so because the chiefs liked these uh, foreign gifts, you know, your, there's even a, a record of what they actually received, useless things actually, you know, silk, alcohol and stuff like that, rum. You know, and then all you got to do now is give the Portuguese what they're actually looking for. So the Portuguese would come, if you're a chief of one clan, I'm a chief of the other clan, they'll go to you and say, okay, well, we need, we need, we need some people. You know, um, if you can just find us some people, we'll pay for them. And then you're thinking, obviously you're not going to sell your people from your clan. So you go raiding at night, whatever, you kidnap people from my clan. And then for every head that you bring, the Portuguese would handsomely reward you. And likewise, they would then come to me and I would also do the same. So this was causing uh, all this havoc where this one, people, basically people were selling each other for profit. And the chiefs were the ones who were enjoying these uh, silly benefits. Then there was a woman uh, a sister of the king. A king was, um, yeah, he was a, he was a mild guy. He was, he was not a, a force, you know. So, the 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 sister, the 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 the, the king's sister, decided to take matters into her own hands. She took on the the Portuguese. She built an army, and went after the Portuguese. She recaptured. Just think about that. She recaptured many of the people that were sold by the sellout chiefs in the kingdom to the Portuguese. She went to the Portuguese and took them back. All by herself. Well, not as an individual, but her and the army with no support from the chiefs. So if you look at it within that context, imagine if everybody within just the Congo Empire had actually joined her. <laughs> they would not have been a fight in the first place. The Portuguese would have said, okay, uh, we'd like to apologize and let's talk, you know. So this woman fought the Portuguese for 40 years. And by the way, she died of old age. So there is actually a time when the Portuguese were getting really frustrated because she was uh, messing up their whole operation. So they invited her to talk, hoping 
she might also like the gift. By the way, she was also baptized. Um, yeah, you're talking about Queen Zinga. Queen yep. Zinga, right? Queen Zinga, yes. Yeah. Uh, fortunately for her, unlike most people who do then get baptized, she still, when she went into the water, uh, she came back with her mind. Her mind was still intact. So she was a survivor of the baptism. <laughs> so then she actually went to the negotiation that they invited her to, where the king was still, remember, they, for, they just like forget, for, forgot about the king. They invited her. Because the king was like pretty much useless. So she went in there and they saw it's a woman and having come from the society that they came from, a woman was seen and not heard. So they just couldn't, you know, stomach the whole thing. So they, when she came in, they didn't give her a chair. So one of the men, one of the part of, the, of her entourage, uh, basically decided to go on all four. To form a chair and said, My queen, sit. And she sat on. And the Portuguese presented their, um, their deal. She rejected the deal and said, The only deal is you guys, you leave this place, you stop your whole uh, operation of, 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 of buying slaves from these chiefs and all. And they were quite pissed because they thought, Hey, she might also take a few gifts and, and 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 hush, you know. But she wasn't prepared. She she was she wanted freedom or death, not some uh, some gifts, <laughs> you know, some accessories. So, and then they continued uh, fighting with her. Forty years, she died of old age because they couldn't defeat her. So, uh, th that's another account to show. And she and her army represented a very, uh, basically a very small portion of the kingdom that was being defended. <laughs> Everybody else was doing, was participating in the operation that was uh, opposing her progress. So while she's recapturing slaves and slave people, rather, uh, her, her people were still participating and capturing and selling them to, Portu to the Portuguese. So it really comes to show that the, uh, and the Portuguese had guns, by the way, at the time. And I could give even uh, more accounts when we, I think pro I should probably give, uh, I don't know, maybe two more of just the Portuguese alone. So the, in uh, Monomotapa, is it Monomotapa? Or even in Zimbabwe. Okay, in Monomotapa, what had actually happened was when the Portuguese were there, the, the, uh, the, the Mwene, the founder of the kingdom, was Nyatsimba Mutota. He conquered the different clans from the area around Zimbabwe to the Limpopo, the northern part, the northern province of South Africa, somewhere there. So that was a kingdom. So he he, were, he he presented himself as a king to the chiefs, and those who uh, agreed to the deal, they joined, and those who wanted to challenge him, they would fight, but they couldn't obviously face him. And then those who didn't want to be part of their kingdom would then have to relocate and move to another region. So during that time, the Portuguese were there. Now, this was a unified kingdom. The Portuguese were under the strictest uh, rules that were specific to them only. So the Portuguese were paying tax to the Muene, to the king. That's the first thing. I mean, that's something people could never imagine. With their guns, they were paying tax to the, chief, to the king, the Muene. They were not allowed to enter the city without a permit so whenever they wanted to go into the city they would have to apply for a permit in advance and then the money would grant the permit and only then they would be able to go into the city and also when they go into the city with the permit they would have to leave their guns behind they cannot come in with their guns and the portuguese were in compliance for all this time and the 
and Yatzimba died and his uh, son came up. But then the Portuguese were so patient, they somehow, they, they stayed, they knew, okay, we can't mess with these people, but they didn't leave. Which means they knew that an opportunity would come. And indeed, their patience paid off. So what the Portuguese, uh, they sat back and waited for time to take care of things. So it came a time when there was no longer a successor, a worthy successor to be a Mwene. And then the different clans started fighting for the position. And so naturally, if the different clans are fighting for, for the position to crown the Mwene from their, uh, from their circle or from their clan, the easiest way to settle this whole thing was to go to the Portuguese and ask for guns and a sister, but basically for guns. And so, when uh, the clans came to the Portuguese to ask for guns, that's when the Portuguese said, Hallelujah. <laughs> because that is when the Portuguese had their victory. So, they gave them the guns so they could basically outgun their opposition. And so it was. And then the clan that defeated the other clan basically did not actually get what they thought they were fighting for. Because the Portuguese said, thank you. Thank you. We are now in charge. <laughs> and then the Portuguese took over. That's the order. That's how it always works. Just like in, in, in Kemet, ancient Egypt, the, they went to the Greeks and said, come on, help us, we'll pay you. And Alexander went in, at the end, he's like, hey, hold on, mm -mm. I'm the king now. You know, I made this happen, so I'm the king. <laughs> so same thing happened, same pattern you see throughout over the, the millennia. And then that's basically how the Portuguese were able to take that region. But you will find Funny enough, Monomotapa was not uh, handled by the Portuguese. The Portuguese could not hold it long enough. Because there were further resistances. There's Changamere, Dombo, who uh, embarrassed them in Zimbabwe and stuff like that. There's uh, even... Uh, so, eventually, I think the last... Uh, they, they, took, they eventually took Mozambique and Angola. And they just let go of the rest. They're like, oh, they're so tired. They were quite tired. This is before the British came and all of them. So when the British and the Dutch came, they found the work was done. <laughs> so there's also now another account why I say the Portuguese really suffered. When Shaka Zulu, uh, who was born in the household of Zulu, Zulu uh, before Shaka was born, or when Shaka was a young man, was a small clan just like you have the other clans, your, uh, uh, your, your Mkwanazis and, and, and so on and so on. So the, these clans are still there, but they became unified under the house of Zulu. Because Zulu, the man that conquered all the other clans, then became their king and all the chiefs reported to him. The same, same pattern you find in Monomutapa, even in the formation of dynastic Egypt with Pharaoh Nama, who actually went into the north, conquered the king and unified the two kingdoms. Same pattern. That's what Africans have been doing forever. So when Shaka did that, there were other people that didn't want to be part of it, but obviously they were not going to take him on. So in, in the area of KwaZulu, the group of people called the Ndwandwes, uh, particularly a man called Soshangan Ngumalu. He decided, no, nah, I don't want to be under Shaka. I want to be Shaka. So he migrated, left the region, and went into Mozambique, what is called Mozambique today in parts of Swaziland, and conquered a group of people called Batonga at the time. So they were not a unified, they were just scattered clans like the Tswana people, still don't have a king today. They just have uh, various rulers of each clan. So 
So Shangani, when he then conquered the region and formed the Gaza Kingdom and became the king and named the people Amashangan after himself, he drove out the Portuguese. He drove them up to the north. These guys really suffered. So when you look at that picture, it's really impossible to give an actual account where Europeans said, hey, let's have a, a, a toe to toe battle. And you know how everybody knows about Shaka Zulu, right? But we never hear anything about King's Kukun of the Babedi people. This man was a legend because the Boers who, the, the Dutch settlers who uh, are supposed to be warriors and all that, they were not as strategic as like the Portuguese and the British. They were more like, uh, let's fight physically, you know. So, uh, Shaga had, had been slain by then. And uh, they, oh yeah, they, they actually, no, no, no. Uh, it's a different account actually. Uh, Skukune. The Dutch settlers fought Skukune. They could not defeat him with their guns. They fought him for a while. They could not defeat this guy. The British came and said, no, 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 that's not how it's done. You're not going to fight these people. These people are, s whatever they call us, savages. These, pe these people are demons on the battlefield. You cannot defeat these people, you know? And the British general at the time decided to lay out the plan. We're not going to do this crazy stuff of sweating and fighting this guy. You can't defeat this guy, you know. So the British studied him and they found out he has a half-brother called Mampuru, who was most probably jealous of him because he was king and he was not. And so they appealed to uh, Mampuru. And Mampuru said, hey, you're right. I am the, the rightful king, not this guy. And well, I'm just adding that part. I'm not saying it's in the historical record, but I guess if they, they actually managed to recruit him, and I'm sure that was part of the, 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 the whole discussion. And, and then they got him and his men, and then they got, as if that was not enough. In the area, it's called Mpumalanga, the province. There's a group of, so, so it's a, it's a, that province has more, de more, more groups of, of Africans than any other province in the country, in South Africa. So, but they, they, they also got a group of Swazis in the area, Swati people, to, to join the army. And they put together this massive army against one man. I mean, hey, that's how they defeated it. And just, that just comes to show because they knew they couldn't do it toe to toe, you know. And today, last, last part of it, today in South Africa, there is every year on the 16th of December, the Dutch settlers make their biggest celebration is defeating Amazulu. And when we say Amazulu, that means if you look at African indigenous people in this country, you subtract all the other groups, you subtract the Makosa, you subtract Amandele, Amashangani, Amavenda, Vavenda, the Vatwana, like you exclude the biggest part of of the group. Yes, Amazulu they the, the biggest nation. But when you put all the others together, obviously they they don't even make up half of the, the actual population. So these guys, just a few weeks back, they go to a place in Pretoria. They've built a monument to celebrate. They've been doing this for the past, I don't know how many hundred years, 300 years or whatever. Uh, they've been doing it faithfully every year. And at 12 o'clock, they gather there at the monument to witness the sun shine upon the shrine that they built towards the god. Before they even went on the battle, they 
they made a vow unto their God. Like, think about that. It's a big deal. If you really have to celebrate the defeat of someone for over 200 years, that means you're dealing with a badass group of people. And so, when we look at that, how the, the Dutch settlers defeated Amazul, I guess the, the leader at the time probably underestimated these guys because prior to that battle, Amazulu had slaughtered these Dutch settlers. So I guess it's pretty easy to kind of underestimate someone you, you, who's as you would before. So what had happened is the, the Dutch came up with a brilliant plan because Shaga had uh, changed the whole battle formation or the actual method because prior to that, the throwing of the spear was what people used to do. And so Shaka's like, that's a waste of ammunition. You must, he broke the spear that was longer, made it shorter, and said, you actually walk up to the person and stab him. Don't be a coward and be throwing things. Go to the man, face him toe to toe. Feel his breath, you know, feel his pain when you stab him to death. So that's what they did. So the, the, the Dutch, Saw so all of that and and uh, and figured, ha, huh, okay, if these guys can fall for this trap, then we we good. And so they they brought the battle to the river. Now, yes, yeah, where, where the the whole trick was, the river meant Amazulu. The, the Dutch were not gonna the Dutch settlers were not gonna cross the river to go and and deal with Amazulu. They went on the other side of the river and said, come, come get us. And so. They went and they had to actually swim. Imagine you have to swim with your spear and then go in and, and stab the person. And so the boys had all the time to be shooting, shooting them one by one. And so that's how the, bull, the, the Dutch settlers won the actual battle. It was not a fully toe-to-toe -to -toe fair battle. They would not have won it. But I'm just talking about Amazul only, right? And it's still a big deal for them. And for centuries to come, they will be telling their children to celebrate it and thank their God for the victory over a, a small percentage of the native people. Yet, in 1994, when, the, when we, there were negotiations between the politicians and the the, the the apartheid government we were told that we had to negotiate because it was going to be bloodbath <laughs> so if you now really uh, take the picture out painted what kind of a bloodbath would have happened now fast forward we have guns and also going back if you even study i'm not even going to go into it because it's just going to prolong it too long if you Look at the, the because the, the African National Congress had, had a, a military unit that was trained in Russia. And these guys came and uh, so there were, they were, many of them were in exile and stuff like that. So there were many battles that the South African National, the South African Defense Force of the apartheid government had fought along the frontline states all the way to Angola. They lost many of those wars. But a lot of this information is hidden from the public, obviously, because you can't tell the people, guys, you need to understand, we had to negotiate, because if we didn't, whew, there was going to be bloodshed. So to avoid bloodshed, we had to negotiate. But the truth is, that was not the case. That was not the case. So um, I don't know if you would like to add to that. Uh, I may perhaps have spoken too long. <laughs> well, no, it's a, it's a good lesson in history because my, my African knowledge is not as fast as yours. Um, but I would I would say that, like, you, you run into, I think there there's, there's two things that, as I read more African history, I feel like one thing, and this is not really the topic, but I think that one of the things that selling slaves uh, gave, or I think, at least this is my belief, this is not substantiated anymore. Yeah. Um, the one benefit of selling slaves is that you you force 
um, Africans to exist outside of Africa. And it seems that this has probably happened in cultures throughout Africa, whereas even though you sell slaves and they are not no longer in your current culture, they grow up and they still remember, they still remember when they still have some connection to um, your original culture. And I think that, like, even though it may seem like certain things or certain times in history um, that those were losses, uh, in an extended time period of history, you know, those are gains. And I think a lot of times when we look at, um, even, even in the book of the destruction of African civilization, I don't think that we really look at the entire picture of, like, yes, you may have, certain countries may have given up people maybe they have lost a few battles or whatever but the sum total of the events is not a negative right even though it may seem that africans are maybe at the the bottom of consciousness um ancestors were very smart in how they how they dealt with their political struggles overall and that we're not we're not really at the bottom of anything it's just not we're we're not awakened to much of our history, which is kind of a different a different problem, but um, but not a but not a defeat. And I think that's part of your point as well, um, in the sense that even though um, it may seem that certain Africans were defeated or whatever, you know, it's not truly the case. Um, and I think to go even further, which is from my original point, is that. I think that in the majority of African cultures, at least in the political landscape, they are constantly trying to make compromises to avoid uh, the need for, for battles. Now, I don't live in Africa, so I don't really know what the I don't know what the climate is as far as military action is in Africa. But over here, it seems that that it seems that that's what's happening, even though it's kind of characterized differently. All right. Okay. Thanks. Um, uh, just to remind everybody, uh, we will uh, we, we will open for uh, for the uh, for people's comments. I see a request for for, for Mike. Uh, we will open for everybody else to speak, but, uh, because uh, the discussion is still between me and uh, rather nobody. Uh, it, it was supposed to be, be basically a debate, but yeah, it ended up as a discussion. So, uh, in terms of in in terms of um, having to negotiate or anything, Africans have never been in a position where we had to compromise for our own protection. All these are, are cases of individual selfish ambitions of people. Just like with the examples that I gave with Queen Zinga, who put the Portuguese, in, Portuguese army in check all by herself without assistance from the king and the other chiefs, which show that the Portuguese actually stood no chance. However, the Portuguese still won because of the love of gifts among the chiefs. And that has not changed. It's still a problem we still have. Speaking of, you spoke of the, uh, of, of the area where you come from. You come from the United States. Uh, I can tell by your accent, yeah. unless, yeah. So, uh, even when you look at the Western Africans were actually captured in the Western Hemisphere, we look at the Haitian people who defeated the, their capturers uh, and took over and built a new republic, a new African republic in the Western Hemisphere. That also gives you more examples of how Africans are actually 
not a force to be reckoned with on the battlefield. If you want to take Africans, you need to you need to use a different avenue. And the avenue that has always worked to conquer us has been through uh, invading our spiritual world. So how do you do that? You bring gifts to the door because the door to the spiritual world of any African community has always been the African leader who stood as the priest among the people. And if, when he gets baptized, and yeah, the people on the ground resisted religion for a while, but eventually they had to give in because he applied certain, because there were more incentives for him to get the people to comply. And, and so he did what he did and the people were then forced to comply. And I mean, until today, we even have groups of people such as the Dogon people, one of the reasons why in Africa or throughout the world we have African people who have isolated themselves and we coming from a westernized world, we look at them like, oh, they live a very primitive life. The Dogon people came from East Africa. And there's also uh, sayings of them having come from ancient Egypt. There were obviously many migrations out of ancient Egypt that ended up in, in, in inner Africa. Many of the people like the Kalenjin that are found in Kenya and Tanzania actually came from ancient Egypt. The Luo people as well that are found in Kenya and, uh, and Tanzania also came from ancient Egypt. So there were many migrations after Africa, uh, after the basic, I would say, probably from the 25th dynasty after uh, there was no longer hope for a recovery like the, the other different times. So what we actually, uh, the Dogon people then fled to the mountains. They live in, in West Africa now. They fled to the mountains to escape the same religion because they, they figured, okay, these people, uh, once you, you meet, you, in fact, there's even a, a, I think it's the Mossi people who, I think it was an old man who made a prophecy that when the first white man comes here, the people will die. It's also in the book, The Destruction of Black Civilization. So throughout, what we actually find is you always find a case of that few people, one for their own selfish ambitions, will sacrifice the whole nation. And that is how exactly the reason why Africa belongs to the West today, you know, and it's still continuing. The same chiefs that, uh, that, that encountered the first Portuguese, first European and Arab settlers, their descendants today are our political leaders. And uh, unfortunately, many of our people have hope in, in, in African politicians because of and you even hear things like Pan-Africanism doesn't work. It's, an, it's, an, it's been a song forever. But most people don't even know what actually Pan-Africanism is because Pan-Africanism was hijacked by black politicians. And coming back to your part of the world, you will have noticed that Malcolm X was very intolerant of the... The, 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 the white man in the United States and spoke out uh, against him very intensely in all in, whether it was the media interviews or actual interviews where he was invited he never shunned away but you'll notice that when he went to Mecca he said something about in Mecca uh, there was no white and black. Uh, yes, you, there was a white man, but he didn't, when he said I'm white, he was talking about his skin color, but he wasn't saying it didn't mean the same thing as the white, as the white man in the, in the United States. When he says I'm white, he means I'm boss. So, unfortunately, the Honorable Malcolm X was deceived when he went to Mecca because 
The Arab world is even more trickier. There's even, uh, previously I did a, a, I have a video on my YouTube channel where I actually talk about the Sands Revolution. This is the oldest African revolution that I've, <clears throat> in terms of uh, against Arabs, obviously we have older revolutions, obviously. But Arabs were obviously the first people that actually uh, came to Africa and the first time when black, a black skin became synonymous with slaves is when Arabs came on the during the seventh century and took over. Uh, oh, necessarily took over, but yeah, and and uh, invaded Africa. So the 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 group of Africans that were captured that were staying in in Iraq, they conquered the king there and established a city <laughs> that lasted for several centuries. Uh, is it centuries? Okay, but it, it lasted for a while. I'm just uh, my memory might not really serve me well right now. But for this caliphate, this caliphate king, for him to defeat these uh, African revolutionaries that had defeated him and took over the city for a very long time. It was not centuries, obviously. He would have been dead by then. So. But it was quite a few decades. Uh, he eventually got help from outside to be able to defeat them. So it's, you see, it, it, it's, a, it's like a mirror reflection of the Haitian Revolution. So in actual fact, the only thing that Africans, uh, that makes Africans uh, subject to Arabs and Europeans is the spiritual invasion. And that's all there is. There is nothing else because uh, when when Malcolm X visited Mecca, and so because the thing is, one thing one that people don't realize is if you visit a country in the Arab world, they're not gonna treat you like the way the same way they treat you black people. They treat the black people in that region. It's not like in the Western world. If I go to the United States, I'll be treated like a, any other black person there, an African-American, basically. But when you go to the Arab world as a visitor, not to stay, but as a visitor, you get this, they, they treat you very well. Hence, you'll see many of the African leaders are very close to Arabs. They, are, um, they, they, they love uh, they've got ties. I mean, you know, your Nelson Mandela's was friends with your Gaddafi's and all these African leaders. In fact, the African Union was formed based on that uh, deception. But in actual fact, when you go to their country, how are black people treated there? Because, I mean, it's common sense if uh, Mama Gaddafi can tell me about Pan Africanism. My question is, what have you done at home? Let's see some of your. Which, uh, how many black people, how have you empowered black people? You look at the whole North, North Africa, there has never been, a, not never, never, ever, you don't find any African, a black person in, in charge or becoming president. It doesn't happen. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so, all, I, all I'm saying is we lost the spiritual war. That is exactly what we've lost. And this one is even worse than a losing a physical battle. So when you lose a physical battle, you can go back to regroup and then uh, go back and fight. But when you're dealing with a spiritual battle, that goes, you're dealing with the soul of the people. You've, de you've conquered their soul. You've captured and slayed their soul. Because you, you look in places like Nigeria, where uh, Christian Nigerians and, and Muslim Nigerians kill each other. And now Africans, many people are saying, why don't we just unite? You know, as if, uh, and I guess people usually say that uh, not understanding the underlying factors involved. You know, because the question is, what are we uniting about? Our skin color? People don't, human beings don't naturally do that. You, you can temporarily try it, it doesn't really work. 
you know. So, and Europeans are not uniting because of their color only. They are uniting because of their need for survival. Uh, they are the weakest link and the minority in the world. So, they, had, they know that if they're ever going to be comfortable in this world, they need to hold power and and that's basically survival for them. And their own imagination, they actually think will destroy them or anything. But yeah. So yeah, that's uh, I think that's it from my side. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, brother. And then we'll open yeah. the floor yeah. for other people. I mean, that's a, that's a well-being position, though, uh, that uh, they, they believe in their... Um, um, they need power because of destruction. Um, or, excuse me. They destroy, or white people destroy, because uh, of a need for um, survival. Um, it's, in, it's an interesting thought. I don't know if I agree with it 100% for, from Wellesley's point of view, but I think that it, it definitely uh, can answer a lot of questions. Um, I think also, when we think about um, Pan-Africanism Pan and also unification of black people, um, at least in America, I don't know how it was in Africa, but at least in America, we generally don't have a way of connecting with each other outside of our race. So our, our, our differences are kind of modeled by the connection and it, it creates an, a, a problem. Um, and I don't know, I don't know how to solve it. Um, and I also don't know if there's a solution for, um, spiritual, as you said, spiritual battle losses, especially when your, I guess, the new spiritual leader is really copying elements of your past leaders and then passing themselves off as the leader. Um, I'm not really sure how that, how there's a solution for that. And I don't know if that exists in history books because I'm not sure it's ever happened. Oh, oh you mean, you, oh, you mean the, 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 the restoration part? Oh, right, like because the... I think that, like, yeah, because when you're when a, when a past when a new leader mimics um, parts of your old leaders, yeah, it's difficult to it's difficult to conquer them because in in one sense they are like you, um, yeah, which is a different type of problem. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there is definitely a solution, and there is definitely historical examples of the solution, but uh, that's a discussion for another day we can <laughs> no worries <laughs> because uh, that would start a new discussion but there is uh, uh what one thing i love about african history is we have a blueprint for every single thing or every single challenge that we are facing as african people be it all these uh, gender wars that are have been introduced by white women through feminism <laughs> yes. by uh, yes. <laughs> by deceiving I mean <laughs> deceiving our sisters and making them think there is something called the sisterhood out there which is uh, white women don't buy into it anybody that um, that knows about the history of how feminism in the United States uh, was formed and they even use this uh, the, I think it uh, uh, what's the, the brother's name? I don't know why my head is like this today, but uh, I think it's, it's not Douglas who actually teamed up with uh, the feminists when they were trying to get their right to vote. And the white man's like, Oh, you're teaming up with the Negro, we won't give them the Negro the right to vote first so men can vote. <laughs> and then the white women are like, Screw that, we're not supporting that, we're not gonna support. It. So Could that's you when it, and okay. You yeah. MLK or? Uh, no, 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 it wasn't MLK. Ah, uh, man. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why, why my head is, is like this today. I'm not... Yeah, I think... It's, yeah, I, I'll, I'll get the name, though. I'll get the name. So, we have we have blueprints. Oh, ML, MLK was later. MLK was later. Uh, was MLK voting during the time, I think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, so, I, I know what you're talking about, but I don't remember that person's name. Yeah, uh, I see his face in my head, but yeah, I'll, 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 I'll remember it. So, so, um, so yeah, there, there is a, 
is a solution from uh, everything that I've gathered in my uh, study of African history. I found that uh, it's almost it's almost like when you when you look at how our ancestors did things, it's almost like they knew that these things were going to yeah. happen. You know, I so, feel the same way. The more I learn, yeah, it's almost like they knew and they left blueprints and made sure that this blueprint is something that you will find. So, um, so yeah, brother, uh, thank you very much. It was a good discussion. No worries. Uh, we didn't, uh, yeah. we, we, we didn't, we didn't break any heads. <laughs> of course not. Of course not. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So that's why I wanted us to have it in space because the thing about, you know, when you, you when people so-called debate, writing, I mean, a tweet is so many characters, people talk past yeah. each other. But when you actually bring it to a almost face-to-face -face like this, you get to really then have a real conversation, you know. So, yeah. Uh, so, thanks. And at this stage, I will we'll open, for the, we'll open the floor for other people to... Uh, ask questions or or add to the conversation yeah and I'm sure everybody can see that it's been recorded so you cannot sue us and it, it will be post posted on YouTube by the way so yeah all right uh, who's first uh, let me go first. Oh, ladies first. I see. Okay, then Eugene will speak. <laughs> and anybody else that Thank wants you. to uh, speak, uh, just request the mic. Uh, yeah. Okay, take us away. <laughs> Thank you. That's okay. Maybe that's how it's pronounced. I think you nobody. Uh, it, the name cuts uh, somewhere, so I don't finish it. And thanks for everybody who is here. Yeah. This is a beautiful debate, and I will begin. Until now, in my uh, in my thirties, I should say, I don't uh, lie around with my age. I do not know whether what my grandfather said may he rest well, but he always said that. And after that, maybe anybody will will, will decide whether he was joking or he was joking but he said that we were everywhere in the world we were everywhere in every corner and we loved everything about us we loved everything that we would see we would touch we would make however we never knew that there exists another type of human being who hate us so they started on us they started on us, and the more they started on us, we continued to move, we continued together, we moved, we moved until we made Africa. <laughs> uh, he was an ingenious man. And that, uh, oh, sorry, please, please story. repeat that. You said we moved until, <laughs> until what, Africa? <laughs> <laughs> we were everywhere. Yeah. The entire world belonged to us, like we were everywhere. We In every corner, you would see us. But every time this another type of human being, and I know he meant that Western culture, every time they came in, we continued to move away from them because we didn't like the drama. We didn't like the behaviors. We didn't like how they looked at us. So we were not scared, but we didn't like the drama. We didn't like what they were doing. We didn't like the jokes. We would sense that they're up to something. So we continued to gather. We gathered. Our leaders gathered, the mothers gathered, and the fathers gathered. And the more we gathered, we continued to go to the very far end, and we made Africa somewhere. So we got out, out of, you know, those states. <laughs> That's what <it> is. <laughs> I, I like that. I like that. <laughs> and he ends that story with this. And he said that, he said, sorry, because I'm sorry he left us, but he continued to say that even when we made our own Africa, they continue to come. And now this is when our leaders were like, what should we do for you? We left uh, the cold areas. We left the dry areas. We left the desert. We left it. But you continue to follow us. What should we do for you? Now, this is when 
who was on the that most of the leaders, I, I'm not going to quote you, but I just speak the word greedy, they became greedy and either they sold us out. But there are others who actually were willing to be adventurous. They were like, you think about to teach us something, but we know everything. But anyway, let's see what you're going to show us. Although the other type of human beings were more of, how do you call them, tricketeers or tricksters, that they had something behind their sleeves. So our leaders never knew exactly what is going to happen. So some of them were like, okay, let's see what you can do. And others were like, you will worship me because I'm a leader here, I'm a king, everybody worships me, and you will do so. But little did they know that these beautiful men in different kings had something else. Now, the leaders would have said something, and the other people would have listened. You understand? But whatever the leaders decided on to, you know, to decided about all decided to do, then the other people, we, the followers, or the, the citizens, or what, what can I say, we had to follow, because by nature, we were following our leaders. So some of our ancestors had no choice but to follow. Now you can imagine being told to kneel down, and you're kneeling down just because your leader said so, but not because I heard your voice. I'm kneeling down because my leader said so. So most of our ancestors um, saw their pride, their knowledge, their beauty, their, their strength being put down by being submissive. Whereby if I said no, what would the king say? I'm used to um, doing what my king says. That's how my late grandfather said we lost our Africa. And then as I've grown up, I continue to listen to people speak, you know. And then recently, Chinamanda, the writer, you know, the lady uh, from Nigeria, said something that really got my mind on fire again. She said something, I quote her, but not the way she said it, because she's so eloquent, God bless her. She said, we travel not because we lack not because we don't have houses, God have mercy, we have houses, we have food, we have schools, we have our families, we love our women and our husbands who love uh, beef. We travel because we are adventurous, it's within us. Oh my goodness, that is when I realized my late grandfather was right. That story wasn't a joke, it was true, and now, um, as we travel, guys, we travel to U.S., we travel to China, we travel everywhere. We've been there before. Yes, we don't have to be there because now we are here, but we were there before because we were in our ancestors. We were there already. So we are not traveling because, oh my goodness, we are poor. As the pictures show, we lack food, we don't have clothes. In fact, our kids' uh, chests are all out and their limbs are falling. You can't count them. No. That is what they are portraying because that's who they are, tricksters. From the very first day, they decided to, you know, invade into our peace. But we are traveling because we are adventurous, because we are learners. We are the learned of this world. We know, in actual sense, we know. We are aware. We've been there before. So, and, and you know, we, we are so brainful that we, we want to learn more. In fact, we want to teach. We want to educate. If you travel to different places, you will realize that you are given an opportunity to educate, no matter uh, which level of education you had in your country. We, we educate these guys that, no, this is my natural hair. It's not a wig. Oh, so do you shower? And I'm like, do you also shower? Because the way you shower is the way I shower. My goodness, I take my time to educate because I remember what my grandfather made he rest very well. He told me I already know everything. Matter of fact, however much they try to invade what I knew by giving me this kind of education. I have a brother here, Odogo, he's from Uganda. He knows exactly what kind of education we go through. 
people we struggle to learn about uh, uh, the, the French monarchy, we struggle to learn about the USA, we struggle to learn about the French, but it's not like we do not know, it's like you are adding on to what we know. You understand? So they may think that um, they took away everything, but in actual sense, we are taking back everything that we had. Because however much they try, however much they divide us, however much they make you feel like without that passport you cannot travel anywhere else. But I've been there, honey. I've been there. That is why even when I travel into the, the hardest or the hottest weather, I survive. Because I've been there. And when it rains, my hair doesn't have to be all dumpy, dumpy. I've been there before in the rain, you know, in those areas where it is so cold. I've been there before. You understand? So if you think you took away everything, you are wrong. So I think that if our leaders stood, you know, and, and, and didn't want more adventure, <laughs> um, we would have, you know, been still the educators that we are, but, you know, on a different level. You know, uh, there is a, a gentleman. Oh goodness, um, I'm I'm replacing Sonny in forgetting. Uh, he's Zimbabwe, but now he's in South Africa. He was a preacher. If you guys try to get his name, please help me out. He speaks eloquently about um, the leaders and the leaders of Africa and the leaders of the West. The leaders of Africa, they would have sat these people down. But in actual sense, they needed to know more. <laughs> so our brave, our desire to know more, I should say, is the one that sold us out. We should have stood, but we didn't stand. When I say we, I feel like I was there when, you know, like the real, real, you know, uh, right now is what they knew, but on different labels. They did have Twitter. They, they Facebook, but they knew already. They My knew name already. is Dr. Mumbi Saraki. I am. I'm not going to take much of the time. I should say that every African, may, may, let it be mixed, let it be you were born in USA, but you were African. They have never taken away anything. L let them lie with these politicians, let them lie with the, uh, the presidents and whatever, the sheikhs and whatever, let them lie to them. But we as a generation that is growing up and knowing much every single day, you have never taken away anything from me. Because matter of fact, the more you arrest me is the more I continue to move. Um, so you talked about the Arab countries. But, it's, it, it, I call it gold. I, I call it um, uh, gold that glitters, but it's not gold. Because in actual sense, if you ever sit down with a money-oriented, greedy-oriented um, Middle East human being, you will be amazed at the amount of knowledge you possess. And you'll be like, you know what? I don't need the money. And I don't need the God, but I need this knowledge that I carry around. So me, as D, a.k.a. Doreen, as the real name, the white man will struggle to make me feel like he took something or she took something. Because the minute he or she starts, that is when I also, what can I say, wake up. Because whatever she's going to tell me, I've been there before, and I've educated myself, and matter of fact, let me educate you. You should forget about your skin and everything, because inside, we are the same. We, If we have to die today, in three days, all our bodies rot in three days. There is no difference. So if you really want to win this mentality they are creating, you educate yourself, you step away from what they are building, and then educate them. But now pray those buttons don't reach on your skin and, and that gun that reach on your head. But they can never, and they know it, they will never take away anything. To end my um, my discussions, is, uh, 
when I spoke to a, an Egyptian I, who had just realized that he is African. Guys, the guy was very excited about life. That every African he was meeting, he was telling me, he is asking, what food do you eat? Are you Nigerian? Are you Ugandan? Are you South African? Yani, he was trying to understand everything in one day. And I only told him, congratulations, brother. Because finally, you were born again. Leave alone the born again religion that is, is going on like a spread of fire. Like you were born again because right now, you know who you are. You know, and I just told him, carry on and educate. Carry on and embrace. So, I do believe that um, the more they arrest, <laughs> is the more we rise. So, I don't know how much more they're going to arrest. <laughs> because they are losing. And I feel sorry about this. However, I should say that there are some that they are embracing and they are overcoming and they are learning, which is a beautiful thing. And they are experiencing that peace. That if any person who educates themselves about this history enjoys. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, Sister D. Uh, I, I, I hear the poet in you. It looks like you also had a very interesting uh, grandfather. Okay. And uh, uh, so Eugene, Eugene, before you come in, uh, the next person that's going to speak is Eugene. So Miyanda, just uh, mute your mic for now. Uh, yeah, so, oh, and the man you were, I think you were looking for is George, Joshua Maponga. Yeah, so by the way, where are you from? Uh, Sister D? Thank you. I'm from Uganda. Oh, I'm from Uganda. Uganda, yes. All right. Beautiful yeah. country. I'd like to visit one day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> brother Eugene, and then we'll go to Miyanda Matanga. I hope I pronounced okay. this correctly. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, I am proud to be in this discussion because... I really love listening. I really love listening to the African. So I am Asian. I am an a. I am a Asian. I don't know if you know about my country, Haiti. Oh yeah, Black Power. Yeah, man, Haiti. We spoke about you during the discussion. I don't know if you were here already. Yeah, no, the Haitian, so... the Haitian Revolution. Welcome, brother. Yeah. As I said, so I am proud to be here, and I really like the the questions. Did Africans surrender or sell out to invaders? So I I, I think that you know that Haiti is facing the, the same problem as the as Africa. So we have been we are we are the victim of some people who wanted I don't know they wanted us to be slaves all our lives but as we choose to be free they 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 have some tools that they use like religion to to keep us almost like slaves so we are we are almost the same so i don't think that africans sell out to invaders because i was watching through the news on friends friends 24 and i see hope I see a generation of Africans who want to save their continent. I see a generation of Africans who want to change the situation. I think that Africa will prevail. So I don't know if in if it is in ten years, twenty years, but I think I believe that Africa will prevail. So we have made some mistake in the past. We have done things that are. Uh, one, for example, we we let the, the white people make us believe that they are intelligent than us. They are the one who should rule the world. That's not true because when you look at the end work of the Egyptians, you see that these people were really smart. These people were were really intelligent. Even now, uh, the the white people still not understand how they create the pyramid. So. Africans are intelligent, and I think that Africans will 
will prevail in the future. And you do you did not sell out the country and you did not surrender because there there is a generation of Africans that I that I follow. I mean, they they want to change things. I I, I watched a girl who, who was speaking in front of Emmanuel Macron, and I really love her responses to 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 Emmanuel Macron. So I think that Africa will prevail, and you did not sell out sell out the uh, Africa because this generation will prevail. And thank you for let letting me speak, even though my English is not as good as I wish, but I, I think that you understand what I was saying, so thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Brother Eugene. Uh, Kopotet Bulekai, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, Africa is definitely going to uh, prevail. And in the closing, we'll close with a statement of hope uh, after everybody has spoken. So yeah, thanks for your piece. It's good to hear from uh, African, the African family from around the globe. Thanks, bro. And the next uh, speaker, Miyanda, you may speak to us. Uh, just uh, let us know where you, which region you come from, and then uh, give us a piece of Hi, your mind. Um, thank uh, you for giving me. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. I, I'm from Zambia. Yeah. And I really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, the share of information. I think what really struck me is um, the fact that we somewhat tend to begin our history around uh, colonization, around slave trade, but we existed before that. There's a history before that. There's a history of trade, uh, which enabled um, Africans generally to accommodate different people, the Portuguese, the Arabs, and all of that. So it's from there that we, we should begin to analyze what our ancestors did. Um, they allowed people to come into our space. You are right to say we could not be defeated on the battlefield because we have superior war skills. Okay. However, by embracing other cultures, by allowing them to live amongst us, they began to learn strategy that would then defeat us. And of course, the spiritual loss, the war against our spiritual connection was the biggest battleground. And that loss, as you pointed out, is really what led to the loss of a whole lot of things. But it was intentional. While we thought war was still on the battleground, the war shifted into our mindset, into our spiritual beings, in, into a space where they studied what we needed. They provided what we needed. So can we say we sold out? I would say no. I think our leaders were faced with the challenge of survival. When you look at, for instance, the Lozi people, of today Zambia, or it would have been Northern Rhodesia back then, one of their greatest fears were the developed people, the war against the developed people. So come this uh, British guy, and he says, look, we'll give you guns, we'll provide you protection, sign a treaty with uh, uh, the West or uh, England at the time, and we'll provide you protection against this group of people. Okay. He signed it not fully understanding what it meant, but it meant sale of his land. You're going to Malawi, you know, formerly known as Nyasa land. Similar approaches were taken. First of all, uh, what's his name? Johnson, Celso Rose and his people came in and basically annihilated the local chiefs. They fought, battles were won, battles were lost. But they came in with Christianity. They came with protection offers. Their fear of the Ngoni people, yeah, in Malawi, basically meant they were willing to give away lands to missionaries who came in the guise of uh, providing uh, protection. And in so doing, 
the whole spiritual loss get baptized if you don't get baptized if you don't become christian we will not provide you protection if you don't get uh, baptized if you don't become christian you will not have an education but remember these people have taken your land so the land that you live on does not belong to you anymore and you need to pay taxes on it for you to pay taxes you need to earn a living for you to earn a living you need to be christian so what do you do? You survive. You survive. That's what I feel happened. Now, you come in and you have doctrine that teaches you that uh, God or the image of God is a certain color or race. And it's deliberate. There's a book by, um, uh, what's his name? Sorry, I forget his name. The title is Rise of Nationalism in Central Africa. And the author basically gives information, yeah, uh, with regards to what happened. You know, they. I'll just read a quote. Uh, I'll read a portion. Um, it says, they regarded many aspects of indigenous behavior as evil and naturally sought to, er to eradicate what they termed heathen customs. Okay. So you lose your identity. They tell you what you know to be true about you is wrong. You are not in the image of God. I am. There is no greater loss that the continent suffered than that of the spiritual loss. But, as many have pointed out already, the awakening the fact that today we can sit and have this conversation from different parts of the world, different parts of uh, Africa, is an awakening to who we are. And I really appreciate the different speakers here who are making that effort to remind the people to say, wait, your history was not nothing. We talk about Egypt, we talk about Kemet, but that's not all. We need to let our people know of Nzinga, of Musa Mansa, of, um, of Benin, the kingdom of Benin, the strength in that. I mean, how did Zimbabwe come into being? And by Zimbabwe, I mean the Zima Zamabwe. They were built by an intelligent people. The signs in South Africa, which tell you that time existed even before we got it from others. They knew how to read their time. They had a connection with the God, the Spirit, and everybody else. We need to awaken that in people. So I really appreciate this discussion because it's really close to my heart. And I appreciate just the fact that there are many people who are alive and are awake to who we were prior to slavery, prior to colonization. Did they surrender? No, I think they needed to survive. And in surviving, we're entering contracts that, you know, they didn't fully understand. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Sister Mianda. Uh, coming out of Zambia, the former Monomotapa, or, or a section of Monomotapa, the great Monomotapa, uh, bringing the aspect of survival there and indeed uh, survival became a matter and more importantly the survival was for from ourselves as Africans and not from more importantly not from the invaders from uh, Asia or from Europe uh, survival became a thing where we even hear of uh, countries like Lesotho and and uh, and 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 and, and Swaziland are called are called uh, the the pro pro protectorates of the of the of the British Empire. So so yeah, the the the, the European has always played these uh, tricks very well. Uh, the survival trick was actually not only pulled on Africans, they even pulled it on the Arabs. 
uh, when one studies the history of the petrol dollar, what had actually happened is that the United States approached the, the countries uh, like Iraq and the different countries that had oil and said, look, you need to sell your your oil in dollars and whatnot to create the, just to back up the, the US dollar as the, the, the currency of the world. Uh, so the reserve currency that is. So what the United States did, they approached these leaders and say, look, Russia, Russia wants to take your oil, but we will protect you from Russia. And so these guys uh, agreed to, 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 to make the, the contract with the United States. But they soon later found out Russia never ever even uh, attacked them at all, never became a threat. So when the European Union was formed, the European Union was formed to compete with the US dollar actually. And they actually went to these uh, Arab uh, countries to make the same deal and say, look, uh, back up the euro rather, leave the US dollar for the following reasons. And, and apparently Saddam Hussein was one of the first people that uh, uh, dared actually to, to back off from the original deal. And uh, having done that, he suddenly had weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> so yeah, um, it's an interesting, uh, I love history because it gives us a window into the past and therefore the future because uh, no one can tell you where you're going unless they, they can tell you where you've been. Uh, so thank you. Uh, now we will hear from Valentine, Valentino, sorry, Valentino, talk to us. Uh, please tell us where you're from, region of the planet, and you may speak. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Exactly. All the way from uh, South Africa. Are we? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, bro. Are we? 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 Let me greet everybody. Um, in the name of Allah, and um, quite an interesting topic, and this is what we should be talking about as Africans. Well, when it comes to the topic itself, I think um, what uh, my sister Mianda has been saying, I think she's, she, she has spoken very well. However, what I would like to say is, uh, yes, our forefathers did very well, but uh, we had the opportunity to actually gain ground uh, with um, with uh, our people such as your Patrice Lumumba, people such as your Kwame Nkrumah, giving us that uh, that freedom. But what happened is we somewhere somehow slept because we allowed the colonizers to come back in another form, and this is where we find ourselves currently. This is where we find ourselves in having a problem of them having infiltrated us and getting some people that sold us out in a form of head of the rest of us. This is why at some point we actually have surrendered some of our wealth, some of our land. When we had the opportunity, when the time colonialism ended, when we got freedom, we could have first shut Africa down, regroup ourselves as Africans, look at our losses, look at where we come from, and then start trading with the world. They came back in many forms, like they talk about religion as today, our minds, our minds are, our minds are programmed in such a way that um, we are messed up with religion. That we forget our own own customs and traditions, and we 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 even uh, call our customs and traditions witch, witchcraft, something that existed for hundreds of years. So yeah, we have we have got uh, we are here waking waking up again. As we wake up, we should then hold ground. 
holding ground simply means that we should not allow uh, what happened happen again, and we should take control of our own economy, control of our own continent as a unity. Because we find ourselves as the segment divided, and we find ourselves uh, not wanting to work together. We find ourselves francophones, anglophones, losophones. That's why they can penetrate and divide us. You spoke about how they did it with Mr. Saddam Hussein. You remember brother leader Gaddafi, what happened to him? How could Africa have allowed such thing? So as we're waking up, as we are growing as Africans, and that new type of leadership, we should consolidate power and take head, uh, take them head on. That's my contribution for now. Thank you, uh, brother Valentino. <laughs> uh please mute your mic yeah thanks thanks uh, for your contribution and indeed um the the you you brought up the examples the modern example of something that happened two thousand years ago and a thousand years ago uh where you have the likes of thomas sankara uh when you go to social media people are saying why don't we, why are we importing toothpicks? Why don't we open a, um, a factory and make toothpicks? I mean, that should be easy. Why, aren't, why are we importing tomatoes? And people actually think, oh, well, if they make me president, I'll stop the import of, of tomatoes, of tomato sauce, I beg your pardon. Uh, just like in Nigeria where the local, apparently there's a story where KFC could not supply potato chips because they are suppliers, because they are imported basically. And uh, when asked why they not getting from the local suppliers and the people want KFC, they want it with chips, not just the chicken without the chips. They're like, but we do have potatoes, what's the yeah, problem? It's in Kenya. Yeah. Or is it in Kenya? Oh, okay, all right, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, the tomato sauce is in Nigeria, yeah. So. They, uh, they said, well, the whole quality control before you can be added to the preferred supplies list and all that, so, which I, I actually understand that whole process. I, I work with uh, that component with companies. Basically, they, most companies have a, a process where they add you as a supplier. And it, it is a specific process that they have to before they can add you on and then you eventually get approved. So, uh, I'm sure many young people think, oh, well, if they make me president, I'll just put an order down, put my foot down, say, hey, you will use our potatoes, you will use our tomatoes, and, and so on and so on. I mean, like, why? You know, that's basically what a young person would, would actually think, but there is much more to that as we have seen here, because uh, pe people like, we, we have blueprints of that. Thomas Sankara, when he came into office, he implemented everything that people are talking about, one by one. He cut off his own salary, uh, started uh, cutting the, the salaries of the chiefs, and said, you know, there's all this ex extra extravagant nonsense which was introduced uh, during colonialism, because what you find is that when Europeans colonized Africa, the chiefs were taken care of. They were getting salaries, salaries for chiefs and kings of nations in Africa, where they're doing apartheid. And it was not a, it was not a luxury for, for the colonizer. They had to do that because it, it kept them in power because as long as I take care of the the king of uh, the 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 Bakwena or royal Bafuke, you know, and so on and so on. As long as they have their platinum mines and whatever, I mean, hey, we they're not gonna get their people, put them together, and start a revolution. They're not, you know. So, and even. A uh, part of a history of revolution in South Africa in 1960, when the after the the Shabvo march against 
the passport because African natives in South Africa had to present a passport that restricted them to certain regions as if they were you were basically making you a foreigner in your own land. And eventually, and they were actually clustered in, tri- uh, in, in tribes uh, because in, for obvious reasons to make sure that we are conditioned to, to think tribally. If you Zulu, you stay in Soweto, you stay in Zola, if you Shangan, you Shawela, in Venda, Shawela, you know. That's why when you go to all these townships, they are still today, still predominantly those uh, cultures to a certain extent. So then the man, that's why I say that um, uh, um, the leader of the PAC, who led the the the, the Sharpeville march? Uh, I don't know what's happening with my head today. Why wouldn't I know? Uh, hmm. Who led the Sharpeville march? Yeah, come on, somebody help me out. <laughs> I'm, I'm having a a brain something something today. So anyway, uh, when he decided to have the Shabul march. It was not about the document. It was a march against tribalism. And when that was successful, when it became somehow successful when the people were killed, uh, the man is actually yeah, Robert Sumokwe. That's the name I was looking for. Yeah. So when that happened, Africans realized it doesn't matter. The people that died there were not Zulu. Or Kosa, they were African. It was a group of people. They share one common identity, African, and they all have the same problem. So they forgot about all this tribal stuff. So the apartheid government, and then the, the, the ANC came up and declared armed struggle. But the apartheid government uh, saw the unity among Africans who no longer cared that you Zulu, you stay in Zola, and you Bedi, you stay wherever, wherever. They became, they started panicking. Because they're always fearful of the unity of Africans. That's when they sat down and they said, well, what are we going to do? These, uh, the divide that we had put together, which was uh, by language, um, it's not working. And then someone came up with a brilliant plan. And the first black economic empowerment was created. A lot of people don't know this. But after 1960, you started having all these black bourgeoisies around the country. And uh, many people have not really figured out why Petrus Motsipe is so wealthy. And he started, he founded a whole gold mine in 1994 on the day of the elections. He was ready. Get the money and the resources to start a mine <laughs> when most Africans uh, hardly get by. You had uh, uh, Maponya in Soweto who had a, a BMW dealership in Soweto during apartheid. You know, a lot, people see these things but have never really put the, the dots together to actually see. So there, what actually happened is that they the apartheid government started looking at the key people because they knew Africans move by leadership. So they started locating the key people and said, we need to compromise these people by making, giving them material access to, to because other Africans were not even allowed to study law. You can be a lawyer, you can be a, a teacher and a doctor at best, you know, uh, Headmasters, during my parents' time, when you were a headmaster, you were, today, you like, a, I don't know, someone that owns a pharmacy. You were super rich. You know, silver spoon. That's what a principal was. Children of the principal. So, they, they then created these, and these became linked to surnames. Uh, when you go amongst the Tsonga people or Mashangan, uh, some of the surnames like Malulek became privileged surnames and stuff like that. 
I mean, during apartheid, one of my uncles owned a, a chicken licking franchise, white man's franchise. <laughs> so a lot of it. So that just came to show white people uh, knew that they don't really have a hold over us, as long as they. Uh, uh, my main concern is uh, the Zulu, the Venda, the Kosa. If I can focus, they can get me to just focus on that. Then they're good. They can just uh, continue, keep us busy, you know, keep us busy with this uh, tribalistic stuff. So, so yeah, and um, I think in closing, I don't see any other hands. So, I think in closing, as I said, we. We need to close on a high note. Sorry, it's funny. Yes, Miss Yanda. Just before you close, yes. uh, maybe this is a question just food for thought or a question for another day. But um, when you look at all this, we have to also ask ourselves the question, what did independence look like or what was it supposed to look like? Um, Again, there's a book I read, uh, I think it was uh, 50 Years of Zambia uh, by Sadanis. And reading that book, for me, opened my mind to the question, when we fought for independence, were we fighting to liberate our people or were we fighting to take control of the systems that governed our people, in which case, we were just looking to own the instruments of power as opposed to actually letting the people live free. I don't know if I'm making sense. But I, I think oh, yeah. it's a bit of yeah. both, isn't it? I mean, it is, it is, we are talking about regular people here. Yeah. Even though they yeah, are yeah. very deep, very deep. So true. There's yeah. a lot we can talk about on that one, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so in terms of the question of what Africans were fighting for, um, I mean, our ancestors were not uh, clueless or gullible or anything like that. But in reality, what the Africans were fighting for was cultural restoration, which is the spiritual restoration. Uh, I say this because even before the first political party was formed in Africa, Pan-Africanism, contrary to popular demand, it's not going to be the subject now. I'm just adding an accent to it. Why it's also highly one of the most misunderstood concepts. It did not come from any politicians from Africa. The concept came from the Western Hemisphere and it did not come from politicians, it came from African scholars from the Western Hemisphere. Uh, uh, we, the concept, the term Africa for Africans came from an African-American named uh, Martin Delaney. He coined the term. He was he's probably never even stepped foot on Africa, according to my knowledge. I don't know the history of his travels and interactions. But uh, why I'm mentioning this is that the original revolution came from the scholars. And the scholars focused on restoring African culturalism. Because the concept of, of Pan-Africanism was not a political concept it was a spiritual concept when you actually study from its origin from the scholars before it was hijacked by the politicians so now among the politicians you had a, a pool a mixture of different animals where you had those who joined the political space with the heart to actually do what the original African scholars wanted to see in Africa. I mean, even when you look at Marcus Garvey, uh, where in the way he speaks of a prophecy that a king will be born in Africa and, and, and all that, um, it's more of a, a spiritual cultural restoration 
from from that perspective and from that angle. So when it came then to the politicians, the politicians were then obviously bought again because, I mean, if you look at a a setup in Africa where you have the common people, you have the chiefs and the kings. Who is most likely to become a politician? <laughs> Not a common person, obviously. It was most likely people who were somehow form of part of royalty. And a lot of these people are the ones that actually were uh, collaborated with the colonizers, you know, to to get whatever they, all these gifts, to get guns and to get rum and and raisins and what, whatever they were looking for. So, um, so in in or in in its original intent, people were actually fighting for the actual spiritual revolution of Africa, a restoration of Africa. Even when we look at uh, the oldest, some of the oldest revolutions by Africans, uh, long before slavery uh, of African people as a people, even when we look at the twenty fifth dynasty, it was. A spirit, when you when someone actually studies the the victory stellar of of Pharaoh Pianke, you can actually see it was not a political revolution; it was a spiritual revolution. So, obviously, the Africans understood that, and even the unifiers of of, of African people, such as your Shaka Zulus, your Nyatsimba Mutota, and the the Congo Empire, and all of that. The, the unification was more spiritual than political. Yes, the political aspect was part of it. So, um, because at the end of the day, what people need to understand is that African culture, uh, Africans generally no longer practice culture. So what we've done is, because we view our culture as demonic, which is the truth, uh, most of us do, we take portions of what we want, you know, things like um, uh, Lobola, Mahari, uh, Mahari, uh, we don't really have an English word for it, you can say dowry, but it's not a, it's not a proper, or someone can say bride price, but there is a difference between a bride price and actual African Lobola. Uh, and in fact, that's I'll be interviewing some someone on Sunday uh, regarding the whole concept. Because at the end of the day, when you look at the the whole thing of Lobola, all actually all African customs are centered on ancestral rituals. So when you have been indoctrinated to see that as demonic. You move away from that. You shy away from it. So you, some uh, like in South in South Africa, you've got th something like unveiling when someone was uh, uh, passed on and they were buried. You've got the unveiling of the tomb. Christians have uh, there are certain Christians, African Christians that practice that, but they remove the ancestral rituals out of it. Um, people love Lobola because there's money involved. They want to take money out of it. Like, oh, uh, if a daughter, this guy wants to marry her, I'll get her under K. So they want to do that. They don't want to get rid of it. But they will remove the, the, the actual intent of the whole thing. So, so why I'm speaking of that is that uh, it's, it's not like they did not know and they, they fought for, or maybe they, they, they did not... Or they were not like someone who went to negotiate and they sold themselves short. It's more like Europeans just did what they've always done, the Arabs, what the Arabs have always done, which was to compromise the, the whole process by uh, buying certain people. I mean, Thomas Ankara, it was easy for Europeans to uh, assassinate him. Because what he did, because since freedom requires a sacrifice, he sacrificed on his part. However, what he did not take into consideration is that the chiefs that were under, that were uh, uh, ruling over the different clans, did not have the same vision. 
They were not willing to sacrifice all of that because he had to cut off some of these extravagant benefits that they were getting from the the colonial uh, masters. So he removed those and they became disgruntled. They're like, we hate this guy. And so the Europeans came. They probably were like, hey, so how do you feel now? How do you like your new ruler? You're not getting your cigars anymore. <laughs> and... And they're like, we hate him, we hate him. He's like, yeah, don't worry, we also hate him. Let's make a plan. And they killed him. Same as Patris Lumumba, same as Chris Hani, same as uh, Steve Biko, it, and the list goes on. So um, that's my answer. The, the, it's not that in the beginning they did not fight for the right thing. It's just that we still have problems amongst ourselves. We have serious spiritual problem where you can have uh, two groups of Africans of the same lineage and whatnot. Look at Nigerians, Christian Nigerians and Muslim Nigerians actually uh, stacking up coffins of, uh, because of religious differences and stuff like that. So uh, that may sound so hopeless and sad, but in, uh, I think in closing, I would like to come with a message of hope. And the message of hope, I would also like to use one, use Europeans as they are, because they had to, uh, they had to, they were under Africans, African domination for 800 years. We are talking about half of that right now. And with them, it was not a spiritual domination. The only thing they had to deal with was the actual physical uh, uh, revolution. Because when the Africans ruled Europe from 711 to 1492, they they did not impose any cultural um, uh, yeah, restrictions on the Europeans. They did not have, the Europeans did not have to, I mean, many of them, the, the, most of the, the Africans that went in there were Muslim. They, they still let them practice their Christianity and even have their own Afri Christian laws. They only imposed Islamic law when a war was involved in the in the dispute. So, uh, but one of the Europeans had a vision. King Alfonso, it started with one man. He had a vision to lift Europe up. And, but the, the difference is obviously before the, the Moors went into Europe, Europe was in a worse state. They were... Uh, poverty stricken, disease, uneducated, and yeah, they really lived a terrible life. They, so the Moors really uplifted their lives, but they were ungrateful, of course. So he saw that, and instead of being like most of the Europeans and hating these uh, Moors, because <laughs> believe it or not, racism was practiced against the, the dominant people <laughs> who were the Africans back then. It was the Europeans who were actually writing literature about their rulers, saying they are black like Satan and things like that. And the Moors never said anything bad about Europeans so, uh, during their, their times of ruling Europe. So he had a vision for Europe. And so he started a school, Toledo School of Translation, where they took the manuscripts because he saw that Europe can become great if we can get this guy's knowledge. These guys are brilliant. We admire them. We just need to get what they have. We might not like them, but uh, we, they're not, probably not going to be here forever. So he started a translation school where uh, manuscripts were translated first into Spanish and then into other uh, European languages. And so the schools started spreading throughout Europe and Britain and all that. And the knowledge was 
uh, that's where you started having a small percentage of, of Europeans that were uh, very hungry for the knowledge. It was still a minority because even how many years, uh, even centuries after the Moors were removed out of Europe, you still had high illiteracy and still people saying that uh, the earth is the center of the universe and uh, the earth is flat and whatnot. Because actually that, that's where the whole concept started in the, in the, in the medieval times. So then uh, finally the last king of the last Moorish king was conquered in Spain in 1492 and he handed over the keys to the city to uh, queen, the queen of the Spanish people. I think it's, uh, um, yeah, whatever her name is. <laughs> I don't know what's happening with me today. And so she, uh, the, the Moors were then uh, exiled. Some of them stayed and then they, they were subjugated. That's when Europe had its renaissance. They took our knowledge and they built a society. They had to have a secret society because it only took a very small percentage. The rest was still backward and still hating. Uh, they, because even when the last king was removed, the church burnt a lot of the books, <laughs> which uh, Alfonso would not have done. He would have preserve them and translate them into a different language. And that's when Europeans, the first European uh, learned to set, to sail the ocean. About more than 2,000 years after Africans had been, had built the first boat or ship with a candle. And so Europeans rose to power, they went all around the world, and doing their thing. As, uh, as uh, Mr. Nobody was mentioned earlier that even the guns that they came with, they came from the war. So we gave them everything that they used against us and empowered them. So they had hoped 800 years later, they managed to get rid of those Africans and, to go and came out to take over the world using the knowledge that they had. And even from our blueprint, we have had many uh, revolutions, spiritual revolutions that have the greatest revolutions where we've restored our, our uh, kingdoms, spiritual kingdoms, uh, restored the minds of our people. So, so there's definitely a hope and part of it, why, part of the reason why uh, Someone mentioned that this discussion where Africans coming from all over the world uh, that are part of this discussion. And this is a sign of, of, a, of the tide turning because 20 years ago, you couldn't find really this discussion at this mass. You could only find it amongst the scholars, you know. Uh, the great scholars like our Dr. Yosef Ben Yohanan from Ethiopia and uh, Dr. John Henry Clark from United States and our uh, Dr. Ivan van Sertma from uh, uh, Guyana. So the, that's where it used to happen. But now we are having the masses having this discussion. And uh, part of the reason besides technology is the fact that the, the, the universe is going through a change. For the past 2,000 years, we have been in an age which uh, our ancient uh, astronomers, the Africans who, who mapped the movement of, of the, 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 the celestial bodies and their positions, the constellations, created the zodiac which takes about 25,000 years to complete a cycle, which is called the great age or the great year. And within those, you have the 12 ages. So for the past 2,000 years, we've been in the age of Pisces, and that is the age of sleep. 
it is signified and symbolized by the two fish that are submerged in water. Submerged uh, is symbolic of sleep and subconscious. You know, you are not conscious. And so this has been, hence the Europeans have been able to uh, even dominate us uh, spiritually using the methods that they had used. It was not a matter of us being stupid. But these are spiritual things, the spiritual matters. Hence, even the, the people that wrote the religious books could predict uh, and, and write things, so-called prophecies, and say, in the last days, people will be lovers of themselves. Because those are patterns that our ancestors had mapped when they created the, the zodiac, and they and they had, uh, shown what the different ages, what spiritual vibrations they bring. And so from the ancient times, they knew that even before the age of Pisces ever, we of this current age of Pisces, because for you to form a, 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 a zodiac, which is 25,000 years, you have to at least observe it for 50,000 years to, 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 to claim it's a pattern. And so... They they had those, so it was prophetic. The zodiac is prophetic in itself, if someone actually understands it. And so it shows us that we have been in the age of sleep, hence uh, people have been mentioning how religion has, uh, has, has had a grip on the minds of Africans uh, to a point of surrender. It's, it is because part of it is the vibration that we are currently in, in this age. And so, in the next age that is following, we are at the A, because each age takes about 2,000 years. And, we've been, uh, and that age was, uh, was marked by the, 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 the so-called birth of Jesus Christ, when the Romans uh, restarted the time uh, from, from zero, because they wanted the age of Pisces, their age, age where they dominate to become the, the beginning of time. So all these things are spiritual. We, we are in under this vibration. And so there is awakening. And we are not all going to awaken at the same time. Uh, some people will actively be on a path of, of awakening. Others will have to experience a rude awakening. I call the age of Aquarius the rude awakening where you are sleeping, you are in your water and the water is being poured out because the age of Aquarius is the water bearer uh, symbolized by a man pouring out the water. So you are in that water as fish and when the water is poured out and that is a rude awakening. It's basically like you inside the blankets in winter and instead of you waking up at five o'clock when you need to be someone comes and pulls the blankets because it's uncomfortable that's a rude awakening so uh the awakening is inevitable eventually but it's beneficial to wake up now on your own because you get to experience certain personal freedoms because to be spiritually free uh, besides the freedom of Africa, just as someone has said, uh, put me in a cage, but uh, set my mind free, something along those lines. Uh, because there's even uh, in, in, in one of the books, uh, the, the, the Stolen Legacy, the author speaks about uh, one of the Greek uh, scholars who became a true mason because when they arrested him, they gave him poison to drink or in his own accord. And he gladly did. He drank it because he was no longer uh, imprisoned by his body and the desires of his flesh. He sought for greater things. He knew that life does not end when this separation between his body and his soul. 
So he became a true Mason where you no longer fear death. We've had many people like that. Thomas Ankara knew that he was going to die. Petrus Lumumba knew he was going to die. These people knew that they still went on ahead because they did not lie, love their lives to the end. They love the people more. So the hope is there are two things. One can just choose to awaken now or by themselves. Or they, we can all wait for the, the rude awakening. But an awakening is inevitable. Just as our sleep, the age of sleep was inevitable. Uh, our awakening is inevitable. And we can even see the wave. The Western world is looking for answers. And you, when you listen very close to how are we going to save the planet, what is the way forward, uh, since the past two decades, we've never heard um, of, of, of this drive for people to eat healthier, and we never heard the term superfood uh, three decades ago and stuff like that. But, and these are nothing but African culture, because the, 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 the solution to... The, 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 the diet, which is toxic, and people going back to the right diet, is basically African, African culture, what your grandmother is eating. That's why we who are here probably have grandmothers and grandfathers who are 95, 97, and 100. But we look around as our cousins are falling at age 35, 40, 45, 50. So the solution is our culture and we can either be the leaders into the new age as we awaken or we will have to follow the white man who will force us back into our culture and say hey let me introduce you to something new and you're like hmm really but this is what we've always been doing so so the hope is is that uh it will not always be winter. It will not always be uh, sleeping time. That's why uh, the Creator of God has given us the seasons. The okay, all these are seasons, but has given us the more shorter seasons, like our your three months or four months summer season and winter and so on. These are there to show us that nothing stays the same, but everything in the world is a cycle. It goes and comes back to the same place over and over again. So uh, our, and even, uh, unfortunately, it's the document is a bit too far. I was touched by one of the prophecies in ancient Egypt where they said, uh, a king shall arise from who is a son of the woman from the south. So there's a prophecy and he will restore the kingdom and so on and so on. So and that's a prophecy that they had written. They could make that prophecy because they they had the zodiac, which was created in Africa. So um, I hope uh, everybody uh, can see, and especially what one thing that I have Personally, that I've benefited from studying our history is the fact that uh, when we think of cycles, of seasons, your lifetime is a, is a blink of an eye. And we've always been around. This planet, this universe has been around for billions of years. Where do you think we were? We've always been here. Uh, we come and we go. So uh, I don't view uh, seasons, and and especially when you look at at the at ancient African spiritual system, why an initiate came to understand that their life did not begin at birth and their life does not end at so-called death. That's why when we look at uh, African languages, when we the concept of death, the philosophy is that there is no death. You know, there is just life eternal that goes 
we go and we come back, we go and we come back. So, yeah, so I, I that's uh, basically that for me. And uh, I will take one last speaker, uh, Sister Zanele. And uh, we'll then close, close the conversation. And we will speak of a, we'll have another discussion probably next week, same day, about the solution. We've spoken about the problem, but it's better to, it's more because problem solving is about understanding the problem more than getting the solution. Yeah. Yes, yeah, Sister Zanel. You may speak. Unmute your mic. All right, okay. Why well, she's trying to unmute her mic. So as I was saying, that problem solving, where most of my friends, when I speak about these things, they say, yeah, 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 yeah. Just keep. So what's the solution? You keep telling us this doesn't work. Politics will not work. This is not going to work. Yeah, what is the solution? And I tell them, that the solution is actually understanding the problem. 1994, we were given a solution which was called the Rainbow Nation in South Africa. Uh, we were told uh, education is the solution, go and get a degree. We are told political freedom is the solution, but all these solutions, people celebrated uh, their independence because they thought that was a so-called independence they thought of political independence, they thought that was the solution. And our people still believe that uh, political power is the solution. If we can have that guy who said we will get the land back, if we can have him as president, we're done. <laughs> but uh, uh, our problem, when we then understand that in actual fact, based on, our, on the discussion this evening, We've uh, determined, established that the problem was we were defeated spiritually. So the solution here would be political. You cannot throw money at a at a uh, a spiritual problem, you know. So, Sister Zanel, okay, uh, looks like she became shy on us. All right, I'd like to thank everybody for the. Uh, contribution whether it be speaking or listening and i will end the discussion here thank you very much and anybody that's interested in hearing about uh or listening to the interview about lobola mahari mahari uh, in, in swahili is mahari i don't know in any other language you can google it if you don't know if you want to know what i'm talking about but that's basically when in, in, in African culture, when you want to take a wife and, if, and then there's negotiations that happen in the process and whatnot. So that has been corrupted just much like every other African custom has been corrupted. Uh, so we're going to get to the actual root and the proper way of doing it and understanding why our ancestors uh, created a custom in the first place. So yeah, that will be happening on Sunday. I'll be announcing the time on my timeline. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Peace and blessings. Peace and black power. Uh, may everybody have a great weekend. Much love. You too. Thank you, sir. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'll be posting this discussion for revisiting on uh, my YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Peace.